Frederick Douglass was born around the year 1818 into slavery, but wound up rising to become a towering figure in American history, a prominent abolitionist, orator, and writer. Joining us now to talk about the life of Frederick Douglass is David Blight, a professor of history at Yale and author of a 2018 Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Frederick Douglass. Thank you for spending time with us, Professor. Uh, Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be on. Gosh, there is so much ground to cover in following the life of Frederick Douglass. But let me start with a broad question. What would you say is the place of this man, Frederick Douglass, in our nation's history and his impact on the world? Well, his most important place or legacy is what he left in words. Uh, He became, I mean, there's the heroic life, his escape from slavery and, and all that followed from that. There's his leadership in abolitionism, but ultimately he became a prose poet of um, abolitionism, of American democracy, of the meaning of the Civil War. He wrote three autobiographies, 1,200 pages. He wrote hundreds of speeches uh, for which some of which uh, are now well known. And he was a journalist uh, for more than 16 years, where he even mastered that craft of the short, you know, political editorial. So it's in words and in language uh, that Douglas leaves his biggest mark um, in, 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 as I've said, in both oratory and on the written page. And there is no one uh, in America in the 19th century who had more to say so poignantly uh, than Douglas about uh, slavery and race and emancipation and its aftermath, which is arguably the great story of the 19th century. We know that uh, Frederick Douglass was born in Maryland along the Chesapeake Bay. What were his very earliest years like in that area, and who and what events began to shape him? Well, he was born out on the eastern shore, as you just suggested, uh, along the Tuckahoe River, uh, probably in his grandmother Betsy's cabin, although we don't know that for sure. He spends the first five years of his life as a child among many other enslaved children uh, around his grandmother's uh, house. Uh, cabin, and then he's dropped off at the great Y plantation, uh, the Y house, uh, which is still there, the house, uh, which was the largest uh, plantation and slave operation in all of Maryland. He spends almost two years there. His formative years as a child are in the midst of this very large um, plantation system. They grew mostly grains, uh, corn and wheat and and so forth. But uh, he saw in those earliest years, uh, before he sent to Baltimore the first time, he saw about all the ravages that slavery could wreck upon people uh, and on children as well. Uh, he was not abused physically as a child, per se, but he saw plenty of adults being um, badly mistreated, whipped, beaten, humiliated, uh, and all that flows from that. So his most formative memories are forged there between about the age of four and seven um, until uh, he is sent up to Baltimore, up to Chesapeake for the first time, and he will go back and forth between Baltimore and the Eastern Shore. Uh, He sent up there the first time to uh, be the companion for a white boy named uh, Tommy, who was the son of his owner's brother. And that gets him to the city of Baltimore when he's about seven, going on eight. And he will spend, of his 20 years as a slave, He will spend nine of them in Baltimore, which is crucial because it's a city, it's a major seaport, it's a major maritime, a place of maritime commerce. He learns the 
he learns a trade, actually more than one trade, uh, working in the shipyards and docks when by the time he's a teenager. It's Baltimore where he gains his full literacy. It's Baltimore where he begins to get engaged with a, the free black community of Baltimore, which was larger than the enslaved community. He attends churches. <laughs> he gets involved in a debating society and many other aspects of his life as an urban slave, which are going to make, in fact, they're going to have everything to do with why he was ultimately successful in escaping out of Baltimore in 1818. I'm sorry, in 1838. <laughs> of course, he uh, writes about all this in that first autobiography, the narrative, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And, and David Blight, when people first started reading those details, those gruesome details of his first years and what he saw, the whipping yeah. and such. How did Americans react? Well, uh, he wrote the most compelling of all the slave narratives uh, to that time. His was by no means the first. But he had, when he wrote it at a tender age of 27, he had already become a very effective writer, a very imaginative and effective writer. And that first narrative, which he publishes in 1845, um, is full of stories about the treatment of slaves, uh, and, and indeed his own treatment. But also it's about his, his observations, his memories of lots of other people. And... He uses these stories, uh, whether it's his own whippings uh, by Edward Covey or Thomas Ald, or more likely, it is the stories of other people he sees humiliated. He sees uh, living under the ravages and the, at times hopelessness of slavery. But, but the, the great thing about that first narrative is that he was able to essentially also write a coming-of-age story. It's, a, it's how a boy grows up under the system, under oppression, but also begins to gain skills, uh, uh, be begins to imagine the world outside of his immediate environment, how he begins to connect again with a whole variety of new people that he meets in the streets of of Baltimore, how, how he gains and then begins to use his literacy. Uh, he writes very deeply about even the meaning of literacy. Uh, in fact, one of the most compelling aspects of that first autobiography is its um, compelling uh, illustration of the meaning of language and words and the use of persuasion to this uh, very young person Always one has to remember that this is, of course, uh, him plowing into his own memory. This is all, of course, retrospective, but he's a great storyteller. And uh, anyone who's read enough memoir or autobiography of any kind knows that the greatest of autobiographies are telling you some truths, for sure. They're telling you the episodes of a person's life. They're telling you about facts as remembered, but they're also good stories. They're the recreation of experience through imagination into story. And Douglas, by the time he writes that, uh, partly because he's already now practiced for <laughs> four or five years as an orator, you know, the use of oratorical language, now what he does in 1845, when he writes that first narrative about all of his youthful experiences, he sits down and puts on the page the stories he's been telling out on the lecture circuit for, well, three to four years already. Um, and what made that narrative short, it was only 110, 120 pages, what made it so compelling is it became a window into not only the physical experiences of this boy and then become a man growing up, but into the psychological world of what it meant to be enslaved, what slavery actually meant on the level of emotion, on the level of fear, 
what slavery actually meant on the level of the relationship of a slaveholder uh, to those people he owned as property. It's also a compelling read, that first narrative, because Douglas is a very manipulative writer. He's very effective. He is writing you uh, a kind of heroic self-liberation story. And Americans love that. They love, they love that kind of uh, self-made hero story then, and people still love that kind of story. And, and he had enough truth to tell to make it work. At what age did he actually learn to read and write? Who helped him? And was there an actual point during that period where he knew that his writing and speaking ability might ultimately provide him a ticket to freedom? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, uh, the first part's easier. Uh, he, he really learns his alphabet and the use of language, uh, to, for reading at least, uh, from his white mistress, uh, the, the wife of of uh, Hugh Auld in Baltimore when he's about eight years old. She, uh, as soon as he arrives there, he's living in the home of the Alds. He's supposed to be the companion playmate for the boy, the old boy. And she teaches him to read and write for more than a year and a half. Uh, she reads out loud with him. She teaches him the alphabet. He takes to it like manna from heaven. He clearly had a skill with it. He started collecting uh, newspapers when he found them. He would collect anything that he could try to read. She read the Bible out loud with him. I mean, the first language he, he hears is not from a child's reader, but from the Bible. Um, so he, he's very early on getting the King James language in his mind. That's where he begins. Now, when exactly did he begin to realize that this power with words, um, whether oratorical or written, and it was certainly oratorical first, um, that's happening even before he escapes from slavery. Because, uh, for example, by the time he is, uh, well, he's about 18, when he's... Uh, He's hired out to a farm owned by a man named Freeland. And on Sundays or days off, he gathers a group. He calls them his band of brothers. He gathers a group of apparently mostly guys, uh, enslaved very young men or teenagers or even younger boys, out in a, you know, under trees in a brush arbor. And, and he preaches to them. He he uh, uses his copy of the Colombian Orator, this book he discovered in Baltimore, and, and managed to bargain for his own copy. This was a this was a young people's school reader that he fell in love with. It was the first book he ever owned, and it was full of oratory. And in fact, it was even a manual of oratory. It, indeed, it was the second best selling school reader in the United States uh, next to the McGuffey reader. Douglas runs this kind of Sabbath school, that's what he called it, uh, for months at this Freeland farm. He's teaching them how to preach. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's doing readings out of the Bible. Uh, you know, and, and what he discovers there, at least the way I interpret it, is that what what Douglas was discovering as a teenager is the one thing he was really good at, and that was getting on his feet and talking and preaching and putting together stories, telling a story, and he loved doing it. And it's kind of what most kids anywhere in the world want to find. You know, what's the what's the thing you're good at? Whether it's uh, you know running, uh, dribbling a basketball, uh, playing in a musical instrument, or just getting on your feet and talking. It's then, I think, that he began to realize there is some power in this idea of language and words and preaching. And he loved going to hear preachers. He did a lot of that in Baltimore. He tells us about the four churches that he attended on and off throughout his early teens and into teenage years in Baltimore. Four different churches, four different men. He names them all. He names the ministers. He tells us what he likes and doesn't like about them. Um, so it's already during slavery that 
he begins to understand. He he's got a gift here. I know it's it's very ill formed. I mean, he doesn't have any any training, and of course, it needs to be said over and over. This guy had no formal education. He never spent a day in a formal schoolroom. But he clearly had a gifted mind. He loved language. Uh, he became, in time, a voracious reader. And he found that uh, once he does escape from slavery, and he's located then with his wife, Anna, in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they lived for three years, he worked as a day laborer, did all kinds of jobs. He worked, uh, he worked carrying a whale oil cast down in the docks. He worked in a foundry. He worked in all. He worked doing some carpentry. He he worked with his hands uh, to to make a daily living. But when he's only twenty one years old, he goes and be, and starts preaching at the local little. AME Zion Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This, this, this guy's less than one year out of slavery. He goes to this little black church, and before long, they have him up preaching. Now, to, to, to preach in a black AME church at that time, you just basically had to be approved by the elders. There wasn't any divinity school they sent you off to. And he gets discovered there, actually, by some, some white abolitionists who see him preach one Sunday. And they tell William Laird Garrison, and the word gets around, there's this young black guy out in New Bedford, you got to go see him. Um, and that's where Douglas first began to learn himself. I mean, he'd seen preachers do this for years by then, but he began to learn to, to do homiletics, that is, to preach to a text. Professor Blight, one of the many places Frederick Douglass has visited and spoke was Nantucket, Massachusetts in 1841. He made a big speech before an integrated audience for the first time. What did he say, and what was the significance mm-hmm. of that event? Well, it's a very significant event because it's, it's right after he's been discovered by the Garrisonian abolitionist out of Boston while he'd been preaching in New Bedford, and they invited him to go on a ferry out to Nantucket, August 1841, for an anti-slavery convention. And these conventions went on for two and three days at a time. He actually spoke two days in a row there. For the first time, to a large group, he speaks to an audience of white people, white abolitionists. And he even there's a place where he says, uh, uh, shook in my shoes, or shook in my boots, I forget which. Um, now, what he typically did in those earliest speeches, and apparently it's what he did in, in the two speeches he gave there, is he sort of just started telling his own story, uh, where he was from, what slavery was like in Maryland, what slavery was like out on the Eastern Shore, what slavery was like in Baltimore, uh, and what slavery meant. And often, even in these earliest speeches, he would work at the theme, actually, he would work at two themes. One was that slavery was even more damaging potentially to the mind of a person enslaved than it was to the body. But then also he, he targeted religious hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of slaveholding Christians. And Northern abolitionists loved that theme. It was one of their favorites. And uh, uh, he, he hit those themes in these earliest speeches. But that was his coming out. And right after that, uh, kind of a star was born. They, they realized that this guy, who was then a mere 23 years old, was really good up on the platform. And the, William Lloyd Garrison hired him. He wasn't making much money. But they hired him to then go out on the circuit that fall around New England, first in Massachusetts, but then around New England as an itinerant lecturer. And from that day forward, all the way to 1877, when he got a, his first appointment uh, from the federal government as Marshal of the District of Columbia, Douglas 
will only make a living to the extent he was able to with his voice and his pen. He no longer would do any day labor. He would no longer do any physical labor. He would do physical labor on his own his own house, his own property, and so on. But uh, he now was trying to be an employed anti-slavery lecturer and eventually editor and writer. Frederick Douglass used that pen again in that first autobiography published in 1845. He actually called himself a fugitive slave in that book, a fugitive yes. slave. What did he do to avoid capture at that point in his life? Part of it became also, I think he had the advantage within a couple of years that he's out on the circuit of his growing fame. And there were plenty of other now white abolitionists who would protect him. And when he was on the road, although it was dangerous because he could be captured, um, he was staying with other abolitionists. He would stay in the homes of abolitionists around the New England towns he spoke in, or eventually even out into the Middle West and down into New York and Pennsylvania and so on. Um, but eventually, in fact, early on, uh, he got attacked by mobs. Uh, one very famous brutal time in Pendleton, Indiana in 1843, summer of 1843, they had a huge outdoor kind of festival abolitionist uh, gathering. And these were often very rural events. Uh, and a mob attacked the makeshift stage and caused a, a, a riot uh, and fisticuffs and people throwing chairs. And Douglas broke his wrist that day trying to fight back. And he claimed that his life was saved by a couple of the other abolitionists who pulled him out of the mob, put him in the back of a cart, and drove him out of there um, you know, by horse. Um, so, uh, but, but I should also say, in these early years of itinerant abolitionism, they sought the hostility of crowds sometimes. They wanted to rile up their audiences. They were trying to um, trouble the consciences of their audiences. And sometimes, you know, if a stone or a tomato was thrown at them or even a rotten egg, that was considered success. It was, <laughs> it was not success if the mob attacked and began to beat everybody up. Well, I've often been asked, uh, you know, why wasn't he shot or, you know, why, why did he live through all of this hostility? And that's a good question, and it's not always easy to answer. There was a lot of hostility and a lot of threats, but the truth is, unlike what people might think about the 19th century, people didn't go around all the time with guns. They just didn't. They used their guns for hunting. But they didn't go to, I mean, even if they were hostile, they didn't take their guns. To a, to a church gathering or an out, even an outdoor gathering. Um, and so far as I know, he was never shot at. He was attacked a, n a number of times. He was threatened. Uh, he got death threat letters, but he was never shot at. Uh, we live in a world today where I find audiences, this is a very deep curiosity for people, and for good reason. We live in a society now uh, so threatening because there's so many guns. Guns back then were a matter of rural life. Uh, they were part of hunting. <laughs> you know, they were part of feeding yourself. And even in, to some extent in cities, uh, people might have a, a shotgun uh, to kill a hog or whatever. Um, but uh, so there was tremendous hostility to, to abolitionists especially in these early years, 1840s. Um, but they just didn't all walk around with firearms. Moving this story forward as those Civil War years approach, did Frederick Douglass have a relationship with President Abraham Lincoln? What did they think of each other? Well, they had a, they had a relationship eventually. They, uh, Douglass becomes aware of Lincoln, uh, I think first only in the Lincoln-Douglass debates which is how most of the country first became aware of Lincoln. Uh, the debates Lincoln has with Stephen A. Douglas, 
in the Senate race of 1858, those famous uh, eight amazing debates held outdoors. Frederick Douglass actually went out to Illinois, actually attended at least one of those Lincoln-Douglass debates. Um, And then Douglass knew about Lincoln because of the press. Uh, Reading about Lincoln, of course, did not win that election. But then in 1860, Lincoln, of course, uh, runs for president, he's a Republican candidate, and he wins. Now, the nature of their relationship is very complicated. They start out in very different places. Douglas didn't fully trust Lincoln or the Republican Party uh, fully in 1860. He tried to. He saw the Republican. Douglas, at this point, we have to remember, was a radical abolitionist. He wanted radical measures out of politics, although he had learned to become a political abolitionist. That is, a believer that the only way slavery would ever really be defeated uh, was through law, through politics, and that there had to be anti-slavery political parties. He didn't know if he could fully trust Lincoln. Lincoln was a moderate. Lincoln was an old Henry Clay Whig who became seemingly a quite moderate um, politician on the issues of slavery. But the great story there is that though they start in different places, and Lincoln was slow at first to devote the war to a crusade to destroy slavery, once Lincoln did do that, uh, you can argue of necessity, you can argue it was by his own will, or you can argue it was both. I think it was both. Um, once the war took on the cause of destroying slavery, which it does um, in part with the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation of September 62, and then, of course, with the final Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 63, Douglas changed his tune on Lincoln. He was a ferocious critic of Lincoln in the first year of the war, even almost a year and a half. He said some very embittered things about Lincoln and his administration right up until late summer, early fall, 62. That tune changes, fall 62 and into the winter of 63. And then they began to slowly move right toward one another in their viewpoints on what the war was about. They will meet three times. They met in August of 1863. They'll meet again in August of 64, both times at the White House. The first time, at Douglas's insistence, who just went to Washington and showed up, he he went to protest the discriminations being practiced against black soldiers in the Army, which he was recruiting. The second time, Lincoln invited him, uh, August of 64, in the most remarkable meeting any black person had ever had with an American president. It lasted at least an hour. Uh, And Lincoln recruited Douglas to lead a scheme. This is August 64 now. The war is in an extremely sensitive, dire moment. Terrible military stalemates in Virginia and in Georgia and in Mobile Bay and other places. The war is not won by any means, and the casualties have become horrific. And Lincoln, for good reason, believed he might lose the fall election. The U.S. was about to hold a general election in the midst of civil war. He called Frederick Douglass, the most important black leader in the country, to the White House, asked him to set up a scheme that he said the war department to funnel as many slaves out of the Upper South into, well, behind Union lines, into legal free status as possible before Election Day in case Lincoln lost the election. Now, Lincoln did not lose that election, and the reasons are largely because of what happens on the battlefield. Uh, The fall of Atlanta was huge. 
first week of September, the fall of Mobile Bay in the last week of August was also very important, as was General Phil Sheridan's moves uh, down the Shenandoah Valley in western Virginia, such that by September and into early October, uh, northern morale really increases uh, because of all these battlefield successes. Douglas never put in place this scheme of funneling slaves out of the South because they didn't have to. Uh, but that's a big turning point, because at that point, Douglas wanted to campaign for Lincoln, and the Republican Party wouldn't let him. Because it's a classic case of, uh, link, of, of what happens in our politics. It's wedge politics. Uh, the Democratic Party running against Lincoln has painted the Republican Party as the party of emancipation, which they were. They painted, painted them as N-word lovers. They called Lincoln every ugly name you could imagine. They even implied, implied that he was black himself, and on and on and on. And so the Republicans decided not the best time to have the most famous black man out there campaigning for Lincoln, even though Douglas wanted to. Lincoln's re-election, though, was, of course, crucial in the continued prosecution of the war, and Douglas strongly supported that. As we wrap up, Professor, a question about the latter part of Frederick Douglass's life. Uh, he lived for decades, really, after the Civil War. What would you say his key contributions were during that latter part of his life to the country? In the latter part of Douglass's life, he, he lives a full 30 years after the Civil War, doesn't die until 1895. He became, well, he became many things, but he especially became a prime example of an old radical who becomes a kind of political insider. And that's what I found so compelling and interesting about the last third of his life. Uh, he becomes a kind of... Uh, symbolic, exemplary leader. Uh, he was sometimes even called old man eloquent. He was called the representative man of his race and all of that. He achieves appointed positions in the federal government, actually three of them, marshal of the District of Columbia, recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, which were salaried positions, and eventually U.S. ambassador to Haiti. But also he still is the itinerant traveling orator. He was one of the most sought-after speakers in the entire United States during that last 30 years of his life. Um, and he continued to speak on all kinds of subjects, especially about race, especially about American politics, and especially, eventually, about the problems of Reconstruction and the violence that set in in the wake of Reconstruction. So, as in the early part of his public career, he remained right until the very end, the man of words, the man of language, who was always there to kind of interpret what was happening uh, to the, the racial situation of the United States. David Blight, professor of history at Yale and Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Frederick Douglass. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks for listening to the Books That Shaped America podcast. For more information about the series, you can visit our website, cspan.org slash books that shaped America. And remember to follow this podcast so you never miss an episode.